Recording in progress. We're ready to go uh, as we record in this. <laughs> and good to introduce, this is Kaylee O'Donnell. If you read the newsletter already, Kaylee is our newest staff member. <coughs> and she is our coordinator of events and programming. And we need the Highland maneuver over here for <laughs> uh, as we navigate this. So welcome, Kaylee. Um, and um, we can obviously. You want some water? You can get just some water. Got a, you sure? No, I'm fine. Okay. Oh, thank you. We will. Other people are kinder. They're going to care for you. I'm just going to. I'm old. That's good. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Somebody to do it. Um, and so uh, Kaylee's uh, role is the coordinator of events and programs. Okay. <laughs> I we didn't probably roll out the communication the best like, to the congregation about getting a new member, but on the staff. But here she is. So. And we have online people here too, so we'll show. Uh, <laughs> that's Kaylee. Uh, <coughs> all right. So Ruth, the Ruth, the Ruth, the Ruth is on fire. Um. So uh, Ruth is a great little story uh, and a fine little like break from uh, killing people. Now it only happens for one chapter. We kill people in the next chapter, so don't worry. Um, but uh, it's it's a fine little space. There's just a few things I wanted to touch on uh, as uh, we move on from that. Because last week we had our staff retreat and that was really great we were over at retreat 21 which is a new retreat center um by marysville it's really nice um but um in chapter nine it's a story that's zeroed in in the time of the judges and so in the time of the judges uh that was not a good time right we remember everybody's killing each other and doing what's right in their own eyes um and so not a great time so the book starts off with this sentence in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem of Judah, together with his wife and two sons, moved to the country of Moab, right? So that's how it starts off. Here's a few, few things that we're picking up on on that. So time of judges, not a great environment, right? Not a great time that's happening around. A man from Bethlehem. Have you heard of the city of Bethlehem before? Maybe. Yeah. Do you know what Bethlehem means? It's the house of bread. Bread. Oh, a little jump on the children's sermon for um, Christmas Eve. If you're coming to the children's messages, that's where we're going to go uh, for the first couple services. Um, we're going to talk about being born in the house of bread. But there's a famine in the house of bread. Okay, so if we want to set up a story uh, that's not going so well, it was a dark and stormy night, right? You know, things are not going well, right? It's like, uh, um, and the chainsaws were roaring in the background kind of thing. Uh, same thing, right? Story starting out. In the time of the judges, there was a man and a famine in the house or in the city of bread, right? That's essentially trying to set up the story of saying, this is not a great time for anyone, even the places of abundance, right? You don't call the city the city of bread if there's no bread in it, right? Um, and the famine, of course, would lead to that. And so then there's a, a, a Elimelech, Malon and Kilion and uh, Naomi, and they all head up into Moab, which was a, a foreign enemy, remember, right? So uh, it just keeps getting worse. And then all of Naomi's family dies, right? So she loses her husband and her kids. I mean, this is a country music song of a book of the Bible, right? Uh, soon the dog's gonna run away, right? And, uh, and so she has two, uh, two daughters-in-law. First one is Orpa. Did you know, fun fact here, that's a misspelling. Oprah was a misspelling by her mom who wanted to name her Orpa. It's a fun fact. It's a true story. 
It's a biblical name. I don't know. Uh, I yeah, right. Can't figure that one out either. Because Orpah does what everyone else would do. Takes off, right? Peace out. It's been fun. I'm going back to my family. See you later. Ruth does the opposite, right? And uh, on page 122, about halfway down, we have this classic line of, of Ruth. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if death separates you and me. It's an extreme, right? But there's a loyalty there. And so uh, we're not going to cover the rest of the chapter. A lot of great stuff in there. But the one thing I want you to think about and what I challenge all the Bible studies I led up until this point is to think through who are, who are you loyal to? Where is your loyalty? Who's your best friend? Um, in our men's group, we talked about this. In men over 35, there's a less than 5% chance that they have a best friend. Can I identify? And so oftentimes in our society, we have grown into this space that I think is dangerous, where people say that my best friend is my spouse. And that is countercultural. Right now, that is like, I get to marry my best friend and live forever, right? That's challenging. Why? Because with our kids, we want them to have resilient circles. We want them to have a friend group in the neighborhood. We want them to have a friend group in an activity. Friend group at church, we're going to have a friend group in uh, school. They have these resilience levels so that when one of them falls apart, their whole world doesn't fall apart. And so my challenge to you and to all the rest of the Bible studies is, if you don't have that relationship outside of your spouse, form it. Think about how you form that's that sort of loyalty with somebody else and like i tell my kids who complain sometimes that they don't have any friends they have plenty of friends but they're in a fight or whatever right if you want to have a friend you have to be a friend right and that means that you have to make phone calls and you have to intentionally set that up and so I think from the book of Ruth one of the things that we'll find out is that you have natural circles of resilience Boaz is built in to be that circle, right? So you have these cousins who are really strangers in your life. You meet them a couple times. You don't, sometimes you hang out with them, but like, because you're in the bloodline, you have to be nice to them, right? And if they show up and ask for help, you should help them out, right? But outside of that, I mean, there's no real link to them. You're not bonded to them outside of blood, but, but you have that resilience. So if you need something, you can go to your cousins or your family right? That's Boaz. That's that cycle of resilience. Then you're encouraged to find other forms of that in your life. Maybe that's your card group. Maybe that's your bridge group. Maybe that's your Bible study. Maybe that's a best friend who you have. And so Ruth is really helpful in our lives to teach us about that. And so that's, I think, one of the main takeaways is, is to think through uh, who's your best friend? And how do you cultivate a true relationship, a best friendship? Uh, not one that you are, like when you're in kindergarten and you're holding it as a power tool, right? And you're saying, I'm not going to be your best friend anymore. It's the greatest power play in kindergarten, right? Uh, because they will hand over everything in order to continue being best friend status, right? They don't care whether I live or die, but if they lose their best friend, it's, you know, a big deal. Um, in kindergarten so um but something more in depth where you actually have real conversation like what's important in your life what's going on good and bad listening to them how's work going following up all the sorts of things that we want to encourage in healthy community i think we get from her all right I have a question. yes yes i want to know why why she said, he lay at his feet. Is that a oh, <laughs> you would, Marilyn, bring that up. 
So the Hebrew word for feet is not feet. Anybody? No. The Hebrew word there for feet can mean something else. <laughs> Anybody know? No, but I'd like to know further what Marilyn said. I didn't quite get it all. She said, why would he lay at, why would she lay at his feet? The Hebrew word for feet also means male genitalia. Oh. <laughs> so she uncovers it and lays next to it. That's one way of saying you're interested. Right? That's not really meant feet and his feet. And they, when they get to know each other, that's also Hebrew for sex. So when they know each other and it's uh, getting to know his feet is a different context altogether, right? Uh, and um, so. I'm sorry, I asked that. No, you're. <laughs> I knew there was always one in every group. All right, let's watch our video and then uh, we will go on to Hannah, Samuel, and Saul. Sometimes it actually does mean feet. Sometimes it does mean feet. Sometimes it does mean, in this case, in context matters in Hebrew, probably not. I did not cover that with confirmation. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was intentional. We are not going down that route with the sixth grade boys. It's hard enough keeping them. I just took it for one of In the beginning, God created the universe, and within it, a planet called Earth. God's spirit hovered over the dark and empty surface, speaking life into it. Light appeared. Sky and land split from the oceans. Trees and plants grew. Days and nights began, and all kinds of creatures filled the Earth. Humans were formed in God's image to continue God's work. Things were really good. But soon... Humans decided we want to live our way, not God's. In their struggle for control, selfishness and violence filled the world. So God started over with just Noah and his family. A few generations later, God made this covenant to a man named Abraham. The land around you, as far as you can see, is now yours. Your family will be as many as the stars and will be my blessing to the entire world. Years passed. Then miraculously, in their old age, Abraham and his wife had their only son, Isaac, just as God promised decades earlier. Later, Isaac had twins, Jacob and Esau. Then Jacob had 12 sons. The youngest, Joseph, moved the family to Egypt, saving them from a famine. There, they grew into a large nation, a people called to be different, to remind everyone what it looks like to live in God's ways. Abraham's descendants, now called the people of Israel, were moved to Egypt by Joseph to save them from a famine. There they grew into a large nation. The Egyptians welcomed them at first, but soon this turned into fear and jealousy. The Israelites were forced to be slaves and do hard labor. But God heard their cries of pain. Through a humble leader named Moses and incredible signs and wonders, God led the Israelites in a great exodus back toward their promised land. As the Israelites journeyed through the desert, God guided them with a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. The Israelites complained about being hungry and abandoned. So God sent birds and sweet flaky manna for them to eat and made fresh water pour from a rock. God even lived in the middle of their camp in a sacred tent called a tabernacle. Along their journey, God gave them special instructions called laws and commands, guiding the Israelites to live differently, to show others how to follow God's way. But the people complained, we don't want to live by these rules like slaves again. Living their own ways, the Israelites wandered the desert for 40 years. After decades of complaining and struggling in the desert, a new leader named Joshua charged the Israelites back into their home. Miraculously, God stopped the flow of the Jordan River so they could safely cross. God warned, 
drive out everyone who lives in the promised land, or they will corrupt your lives. But the Israelites didn't listen, intermarrying and worshiping the false gods of the people who remain there. Soon, God's protection was removed, and other nations overpowered Israel. In their defeat, they suffered, begging God for help. So God sent judges to lead them in battle, defending the promised land. In victory, the people worshipped God. But soon after, they turned from God and lived their own rebellious ways. This became a pattern from generation to generation. This was a time when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. During the time when God sent judges to help Israel, there was a woman named Hannah. Hannah really wanted to have children, but was unable to. One day, she was so sad about this that she burst out crying and praying to God to give her a son. One of the priests of Israel named Eli was nearby and heard her and assumed she was drunk. How long are you going to stay drunk? He said to her. Put down your wine. Hannah explained that she was not drunk, but weeping and praying for God to give her a son. When he heard this, he prayed that she would indeed have a son. Soon after, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel. When he was a young boy, she brought him back to Eli, the priest, and the two of them prayed that God would use him. One night, when Samuel was a little older, God spoke to him in his room, telling him about things that would happen in Israel in the future called prophecies. This was the beginning of a special relationship between God and Samuel. God would use Samuel to speak to the Israelites over and over as a prophet. But the Israelites weren't satisfied with the prophet. They wanted a king, a military ruler, like the other nations around them had. Despite Samuel's warning against it, they demanded God give them a king. Eventually, God told Samuel who to make king. A man named Saul, who was easily a foot taller than any other man, someone the Israelites would trust to lead them. Samuel brought Saul in front of all of Israel. When the Israelites saw him, they shouted, Long live the king! Hearing that Israel had a new king, the Philistines gathered a huge army so large that some of the Israelites ran away in fear. But Samuel gave instructions to Saul that would lead to their victory. He told Saul to wait in a region called Gilgal until he could meet him there. Then they would give a sacrifice to God before the battle with the Philistines. But Saul grew impatient, and before Samuel got there, he offered the sacrifice himself. Saul's actions had terrible consequences. He continued to choose to go against what God commanded and instead build up his own wealth and power, leading to the end of his rule in Israel. It was time for another king. Any guesses on who the new king will be? David, yep. So we're uh, <clears throat> one of the things uh, since we did the Ruth thing, we're not going to break into groups today. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice is that uh, we are now in the biblical texts of uh, First and Second Samuel, and we're in First and Second Chronicles. Now we use First and Second in a way uh, to kind of identify it. But it was because the scroll was so big, they broke it into two, essentially two stories. One of uh, Hannah, Samuel, and Saul. And then the next one will enter into with David. And then and David and Jonathan and uh, Solomon, um, Bathsheba will play a role in that. All those players come in in the next uh, section of it, right? And in Chronicles, uh, uh, so it is one scroll. It's meant to have one arcing story. And we see two movements that are clear in it. 
Saul's and David's story. Um, and Solomon's added in kind of at the end, because at the end of Solomon's reign, we'll move uh, into Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and that is the beginning of the kings, right? And so over Samuel and, Saul and kings, uh, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, we have the book of Chronicles, which in the Hebrew Bible is the very last books of the Hebrew Bible. So for your friends who are Jewish, their very last books are Chronicles. And the reason is, is because it's kind of a summary point of all that has happened up until that point, leading them to the next Messiah. Our last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. And the reason for Malachi is because we hear about Elijah coming. Then we flip the page, in theory, and we read about John the Baptist. And so the movement there is more so that we lead into the prophet of John the Baptist, that John the Baptist has come back uh, in, in a form, our Elijah's come back through a form of John the Baptist. Not, they're not the same person, but that. Here we have this person that looks like, acts like Elijah, calling forth all the same things like a prophet would. And here's Jesus, right? Does that make sense? All right. Just wanted to key you in. We're in the section of the Bible that most people have not been in, ever or rarely. I'll say that. Not a ton of stories uh, about that, that break out of this one. Many people don't know who Saul is. They think Saul, Paul, mm -hmm. right? New Testament. Versus Paul's letters, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, that's not the same letter broken up. Those are two different letters. In fact, there's probably four of them. If you read through 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you'll understand that there are other letters we don't have that Paul references to. Um, and probably more than that, even. Um, so... Um, those are distinct letters, so a little bit of a difference there. All right. So we get into the story, and there, there's three main characters I wanted to focus in on here. And you feel free when you want to ask questions, jump on in. Uh, this is a participation and uh, in movement kind of thing. So uh, I'm going to move through the story. Uh, kind of as it progresses and I want you to filter in your questions or your thoughts or your insights. So feel free to just interrupt. Sound good? Good online? All right. So Hannah, uh, we, we start off with the story of Hannah uh, and Panea. And uh, there are these two women and the story uh, the book, the story has kind of lightened this one up, but um, it is one of these uh, interesting uh, movements and stories. Hannah has no kids and Panea does. And she, uh, but her husband loves uh, um, Hannah more, right? Mm -hmm. And so Hannah gets a double portion of the meat. Hannah is loved. And, um, you know, um, eventually he'll come to her and say, listen, don't you love me more than uh, a son even, you know? Uh, it's like, uh, he's kind of, Elkna is kind of um, self-absorbed. Um, but this, this story should start, there should be some resonance here. You should start to hear uh, as we move through Samuel, like, like you've heard these stories in some way or fashion before. Has there ever been a woman in the scriptures that has wanted a child but not had one? Sarah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And did, Elizabeth. Did they, and Elizabeth. Well, well, down the road, yeah. Elizabeth and Zechariah, right? Uh, but uh, up until this point. And so... There's this movement now around being childless. Um, and that's a very sensitive subject right now uh, and always is, right? Around fertility, infertility, and um, having kids. And do you have enough kids or do you have too many kids or can you have any kids? 
all of that sort of stuff plays into a role, but it's very frequent as we read about it in the scriptures. It's not something that we don't have. These are embodied people that have real things happening to them. And uh, Hannah desperately wants to have this um, uh, a baby, right? And so uh, she goes uh, up to the temple and, uh, you know, is praying to God. And um, on page 130, she says, no razor will ever be used on his head. What is she talking about there? Where have we heard this before? A Nazarite, right? And who was Nazarite? Samson was a Nazarite. Isn't Jesus a Nazarite? No, no, but John the Baptist will be. So I'm just mentioning these things because it should start this. You should be in the part of the story now, 10 chapters in. You're starting to see some patterns here. Some things clicking along the same lines, right? Move to God, a woman who doesn't have a child moves to God. But it, in the patterns, you want to look for the deviation. What has changed about that pattern? in this story versus previous stories. Does that make sense? All right. So as we're moving through the narrative here, um, it should be. So Eli's there, thinks she's drunk and at the temple, right? Because if you're drinking heavily, that's the place you go is to the temple. Uh, now, I've heard a lot of people, you know, crying out to Jesus after they've been drinking heavily uh, for relief, usually, not for children. Um, and so, uh, they are, uh, uh, doing that. And, uh, but, uh, here Hannah is not drunk, but is instead praying with such emotion. As you can imagine being in that space and time of life, of not having a kid and wanting one and the emotion that comes out of her around this, right? And, uh, and, uh, and so, and so uh, she ends up having this boy and, um, and does what she says. She's going to dedicate him to God. Some of you maybe remember that you have several uh, maybe Catholic friends. There you have a couple kids. One becomes a priest and one becomes a nun, right? Ten kids or whatever. Uh, one is for... And there's a line, a lineage around this, following uh, this. Here, Hannah does that. Dedicates him to God. Sends him to the temple. And, um, and gives him to Eli, in this case, right? She has, uh, Hannah's song is beautiful and much longer than this. Uh, in First Samuel chapter 2, and would encourage you, uh, to read it and think about where have you heard those words before about the powerful and the mighty being taken down? Is there something in that that sounds familiar? Right? Uh, again, start to find these links that are happening uh, in this time. So, uh, and Hannah has other kids, right? Um, three sons, two daughters, and Samuel grows up in the temple. Um, and Samuel is really the focus here now uh, for a long time. Um, Samuel uh, will be a prophet of the Lord, and he'll be given over. Um, and, uh, and we have heard this text quite a bit. This is a piece of, of the Samuel story that we've heard, right? You've heard this, Samuel, Samuel, here I am, Lord. Uh, speak for your servant who's listening is what Eli will eventually say to him, right? Have you heard that piece of the text before? Maybe we read it in the scripture. And if you're ever up for reading it, I think the best way to read this is um, when God calls out to Samuel, 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 is like if you're calling your kids home for dinner, right? You're shouting at the top of your lungs, right? Samuel, of course, doesn't recognize it, goes to Eli, thinking Eli's calling him because he hasn't heard the word of the Lord yet. And Eli um, says to him, um, go and say, speak for your servant is listening. 
And uh, oftentimes, this is a space where you, uh, when you're in prayer or when you're in a, a line, when you feel like God is communicating something to you in this world or in your life, uh, that's a nice line to just center your heart. Okay? So when you see the bird that shows up or the situation that seems like it's super funny, why is it all happening? You know, when you feel like you're reading scripture and God is moving in that space or time, center yourself with these words. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And then listen, <laughs> right? Find, take time and listen. What is God saying to you? Okay. I think that that's important. We feel God's presence sometimes more than others. Some months, some years, you have a presence of God. And sometimes it goes for a while. And then all of a sudden, there, God's presence is known. Sometimes God's presence is known when you look in hindsight. And all of a sudden, you're starting to see things. Wow, it's amazing that this all worked out. Um, but if you're in that moment, it's good to just pause, right? These are good words from uh, Eli, uh, who is uh, not the greatest. Fun fact, if you haven't watched the movie, The Book of Eli, uh, you should. If you like violence, don't watch it, though. Uh, but it's uh, it's a interesting narrative, um, especially if you like dystopian things. Uh, fun little story um, to have there. Um, so Eli tells him, uh, uh, or the Lord tells him that Eli is not doing good things. Sons are not doing good things, right? Just goes to show you PKs, not great. Kaylee's PK. Uh, and I have two, and I'm married to one. So, uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, see, here, you know how that lines up, right? Uh, uh, anyway, this is uh, the piece of the kind of, if you've ever heard anti clericalism. Uh, movement, uh, the movement against religion and religious orders, they'll use these types of scriptures to point out over and over again that it is the, the religious leaders, even in Jesus's time, it's the religious leaders that are the ones that are causing the problem. Right? And, uh, and so beware, as Jesus says, uh, who is talking and are they using scripture or are they using their own interpretations um so um on page 133 if you're reading along right that second sentence and all of israel from dan to beersheba that's an important movement because that is start dan is way up in the north beersheba is way in the south oh no they don't have that here if you look on a map it's basically uh, a way that they'll use to describe from top to bottom right everywhere dan to beersheba they recognize samuel as attested as a prophet of the lord right and so uh, the lord continued to appear at shiloh again these places and spaces keep showing up as important ones and samuel speaks out to everyone all right there's a story about the Philistines where we don't have time to cover it. Essentially, God in that story, if you had trouble with this, right, they, they're, having, they're going to go to battle against the Philistines. They bring in God. They, bring, they go get the ark. Go get the ark. That will help us. And they make a big sound, and the Philistines get scared, right? You read this? And, uh, and then uh, they bring it into battle, and what happens? What happens in the battle? Are you skipping over bloody parts now? You're just like, Screw this. <laughs> we're moving along. No more. The Philistines beat it. them. Yes. Yeah. And they take the ark. 
What does that say? God is not on their side at this point, I guess. <laughs> I, I think God is still on their side, but what is God warning them about on this? Um, well, he, they are listening to him. Uh, he is not some sort of magic charm. Right. Right. And in and throughout the battles and the structures, uh, sometimes we, uh, even ourselves, can make God a magic charm. If we have a scripture verse on our tennis shoes, we jump higher and run faster. <laughs> right. This is faith with works. This is faith with, uh, with works. Works is the leading cause here. We think that if we do the right things and God is present in our space and we wear a cross, that we will not run into problems. Uh, uh, uh. God says, I am not your trophy. I am not yours that you take me around and all of a sudden uh, I give you magical powers. You're not powered up into the Power Rangers with me around, right? Don't do that. And so the Philistines then capture the ark, right? They say, well, we'll take this God too. <laughs> uh, not your God. Shouldn't do that. Whole statues fall down, right? Drag on, boom. Like he's he falls down, right? God does nothing, breaks them, and then they uh he puts sores on them or um different things, uh oils or whatever they say. Right? It's an important story in the narrative of how God is to be seen, right? It's not that we use God to justify or empower us or to make our actions more bold. We're constantly doing what Eli encourages Samuel. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Our movement, even up until now, even with the story of Jericho and I, it's a continuation of God speaking and us living faithfully. Right? And that narrative should start to move through this space. That God sees God's people and will be with them. What do you think of all that? Anybody want to? What do you think? Nothing? Sounds good? It's really interesting to me the the role the art plays. Mm -hmm. Because it um, as a former pendant, it mm -hmm. seems, you know I used to hear a lot of stuff from like my evangelical friends, like you guys are idol worshipers because you have statues and you pray in front of them and that's idol worship. And it's like oh. kind of seems I mean, mm -hmm. I get that God is in there, but they're very attached to the thing itself, mm -hmm. right? It's so symbolic that it seems like sometimes in the stories at least it has an importance inherent to itself outside of God like as a symbol of the country becomes a it becomes in and of itself the the only way that they can relate to God now God's form will have a different thing fascinating like side story and I, we have uh, a few minutes uh, uh, the Ethiopians claim they have the art of the covenant, right? And that it is hidden. Um, so the Ethiopian Orthodox Church says that they have it. But there are also several other denominations that say that they have the art. Some say that it's in Rome, right? Um, in, uh, and, and other things. We pay attention to the art itself. Remember, it is designed and decorated similar to the tabernacle to and this all will start to focus back on Eden, right? Essentially, they keep recreating Eden. And when they build the temple, they'll do the same thing, right? Um, and, um, and so keep an eye on it because it, has, it is playing a role here. And, um, and yeah, I think um, now evangelicals are very interesting to be calling others idol worshipers, but... Um, um, I guess if you want, if you want to. Um, so, uh, Samuel 
Um, <clears throat> anyway, they win. Um, Samuel continues on, and we're on page 135. 135. So the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint us your king. See again, he cares. He just can't trust them. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, preachers can. yeah, that's right. We feel bad for them. Um, as I, I, there, I oftentimes will refer to my kids as the feral children of the church. <laughs> and if you feed them, they will follow you. Um, so, so now appoint us a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. And we've talked about this before. What happens uh, when, when you have a king? King wants to take everything. Oh, yeah. We have to give this and this and this. And we have to support them. Soon they want a White House, and they want a limo, and they want a Camp David to go off into, and then they create militaries, and they take our kids, and they take our stuff, and they give it, and they get to decide where it goes and trades. Uh, who is their leader? Those people. God. Right, God is supposed to be the leader up until this point in time. But they look to others in the way that others live, and they want that. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. This then becomes our warning of how we look to others, their lives, and we want that. Same as nine and 10 for the commandments. Do not covet your neighbors, everything. It becomes a warning. This is a long one. And the kings will not end up being good for the Israelites. There'll be 20 kings, no good kings in the north, eight good kings in the south. And uh, they will end up all in exile or dead. Okay? That's uh, how, it, how it plays itself out. This is not good. Um, this is, this is not, this story is not going to end well for them, right? And Samuel warns them of this from the get-go, right? And, but God speaks to them. So Samuel says, but then, but when they say, God, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he says to the Lord, and the Lord's told him, listen, to all the people are saying to you, it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. And then he recounts the same way that God will recount. I'm the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Right? Remember that's a changeover from I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God that led you out. I am the one that freed you. And this is, he'll recount this in, in um, Jeremiah, but this is the same sense, like, this is not going to work out for you guys, and you guys are just going to, but have it your way, right? Have it your way. If you think you know best, go for it. So, from the tribe of Benjamin, arrives Saul. Now, who is Benjamin? The youngest of Jacob, brother to Joseph. All right? This is important. This is important, right? They're mentioning his tribe for a reason. And so, since we have the Benjaminite Saul, who is from the smallest of all tribes, right? But is, is called forth. There's a lot in the call story that happens here, right? Saul doesn't really necessarily at the beginning. It starts off really well, actually. 
he says, you know, I don't know why I'm called to be this. Like, I, I'm coming to see Samuel. Samuel says to me, I was just, but this doesn't make any sense. You want to be a person from the biggest tribe or the strongest, da, 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 da. Like, don't pick necessarily pick me, right? Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts, absolutely, right? This is what ends up happening. He has anointed the leader. Important uh, thing that happens in the scriptures is when someone's anointed, how does that how does that work? You know? When they anoint them, you mean you put oil on them? Is that you mean the actual process? Yeah, the actual process. Yeah, they put oil on them. Yeah. They take a horn of oil and they dump it over their head. Nothing says you are picked as a leader like being slimed, right? Uh, and so here we have slime time. Um, and you are given that opportunity. And so, uh, at could Sam he not refuse though? He could not, because Samuel, the Lord has chosen him, right? So rather, if Saul really-, really Well, Sam, Saul eventually figures out he wants to do things his own way, that doesn't work out. And he goes a little cuckoo for Cocoa Pops. That's really the next <laughs> chapter. He is, is, he is a really, Saul's a super fascinating character. People have done lots of things to like look into him because he'll have, um, you know, then we'll eventually have Jonathan and Paul and David comes into the story. Saul is still king, but Samuel anoints David. It's a you want do you think your Thanksgiving is going to be weird? Imagine that Thanksgiving coming together. Right? David's dancing naked in front of everyone. It's like wow. Um, this the story just keeps getting better. Um, and so, uh, but Saul goes out and you know right away does a lot of really good things. You know, in terms of leading the people, and. Uh, um, so they obey him, but then Saul disobeys Samuel. Um, and at the bottom of page 140, uh, we hear the people said to Samuel, pray to the Lord your God for your servants so that we will not die for we have added to our other sins the evil of asking what did what happened? Things did not go right with Ammonites, and they realized this was not a great decision to make. And so it continues to happen, um, and the, the wars continued uh, to move on. God says, go in, take everything, but Samuel, uh, Saul doesn't. He keeps their king, and he doesn't kill the best. Right? So for those of you who, like Jen, doesn't like when they start killing everything. Um, this is maybe even worse than killing everything. You take all the choice stuff, and you keep it for yourself. Right? God said, destroy it all. And they didn't. What's going to happen? Not good things. That's how you should be able to pick up now, as we've read through this in this pattern, you should be able to start to pick up on the, the way that this is going to play out. There's definitely a pattern. So now that we see a leader that has risen, was faithful, is now unfaithful, captured the king, kept them alive, said, well, I just kept the best thing so that we could have sacrifice. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, it, it is the worst of the worst. And the prophets will really speak into this. And this will, it will become much, much more fascinating as we enter it. Next week is David's story, uh, the Goliath story. You've heard that one. Um, we won't cover it here uh, because we'll, I'll be uh, 
you know, passed out by this point in time from Turkey. All right, we're just about ready to pass out at noon. So we'll be mm -hmm. right at about eating time. Um, so, and it only takes me about 10 minutes to get way too full. Mm -hmm. Two, three, four plates into it and I'll be on the couch. Um, and uh, I look forward to that day <laughs> and sinfulness it, it is, right? Um, <laughs> But uh, you will see Jesse of Bethlehem. Huh. Seems like there's things that continue to come up in this story over and over again. Who is from the line of Obed, a member of Ruth, right? And this is all starting to come together. And he has lots of sons, one he leaves in the field. His name's David. David eventually shows up. David fights Goliath. And there's a lot of really interesting things out there about David and Goliath. Fascinating. Uh, thought-provoking stuff. Uh, there's a guy named Malcolm Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell that wrote a book about um, theories around what was going on with Goliath to make you feel bad for Goliath. Mm -hmm. And Goliath is a Nephilim, and you remember that, that again follows in the story, but he had all these sword bearers and stuff like that, and they, he might have suffered from Giganter disease, which has a whole lot of other illnesses, and so well, you know, what was happening here? Essentially, the fight between David and Goliath was a champion's fight. And the champion's fight was a way to save from bloodshed, from mass bloodshed. You just took your best of your best and put them against each other, whoever won won. And you were fine with that. That way, everyone didn't have to die. It's a really interesting way of, of doing war. And it wasn't unique uh, to this space. It was happening all over the place. David picks five smooth stones. And what we'll be doing in uh, confirmation and other places is the uh, when you're challenged with your Goliaths of life, what are your five smooth stones? What are your five smooth stones? So we've talked about what are your circles of resilience for your people? What are the smooth stones that you will have in your life that will help to slay your Goliath? Right? And you can start to think about what that might be. Goliath can come in all forms. The Goliath, in my opinion right now, is uh, social media. And I think it's our biggest challenge of this generation at this point in time. It's our tobacco. It's our big oil. It's our big pharma. Big tech is a big problem. And we need to think about how we address it. Because um, it, it, it's much harder. Uh, it's not as easy as removing lead from gasoline and paint. We know it's destructive, but it has all sorts of other ripple and implication in the business model. It's been created to destroy us. Uh, so I think uh, what are the ways that we can uh, enter into those spaces and places in our own lives? You may have different uh, Goliaths. You may be battling things like addiction or depression or pick your own you may be able to name a person as your goliath especially going into thanksgiving uh and um that person is causing uh, an enormous amount of you know so what are your smooth stones that you have in your life and as you read through the chapter maybe you can write those down we can start off uh the chapter after Mm -hmm. yeah. So no, I don't think that it's a trophy to have the crosses in, in spaces and places. You're making identity, right? If I wear a cross, I'm saying to the world that that's my identity. If I believe that that cross makes me holier, stronger, faster, smarter, because I wear the cross, that's a bit of a trophy idolization of it. It's mm -hmm. it's putting my will onto God. <laughs> You're supposed to stay here. Uh, all right, right. So uh, I think that becomes the challenge. Oh, can you misconstrue the purpose? Remember the subject object stuff that we talk about a lot. Are we? putting ourselves in the subject and making God the object or is God the subject and giving to us? 
as the object, right? It's that same kind of mentality. Thank you. Yes. All right. Bye, everyone online.